when we designed the levels, we wanted it to feel like challenging, which it shouldn't be. It should be quite easy for us to finish the game. Uh, we have seen some some pre like videos recently who has like almost did a almost made a 180 on Hotline Miami 2. That's just kind of fun to see, like maybe appreciate it a bit more, seeing if what it is a misunderstood game. I really hate to say this, but Hotline Miami turns 10 this year, so with that in mind, it's probably a good time to take a look at the development of the series. A retrospective, if you will, or perhaps a post-mortem. We'll get to that later. Jonathan Soderstrom and Dennis Wiedin, the two halves of Denaton Games, are currently working on their first new game since 2015's sequel to Hotline Miami. Recently, we all jumped on a call to talk about the story of its development, everything from their collaboration process, to design decisions, picking the soundtrack, how the first game came together, their dreams for the sequel, and its turbulent reception. There's a lot here, so let's get to the beginning. First things first, how did an indie dev in Sweden and his musician friend decide to start making games together? And how on earth did their first commercial game go on to be a global hit? So I'm from a very small town, uh, so there wasn't much to do. We had like a big scene of uh, hardcore music, Straight Edge was kind of big in Sweden back in the 90s, we refused and so I was part of that, that scene. Uh, played some music, mostly just hanging out with friends at home, playing video games. I mean, uh, growing up, uh, it was all things from USA like wrestling and turtles and transformers and i listened to like english voices and all that before i even knew the language and we don't do any dubbing or anything here creativity for me was just like a hobby until i met jonathan i was going uh, like educating to be a kindergarten teacher and i worked in the kindergarten for a long time before i started doing the education so for me everything like band-wise or drawing or all of that was just for fun. At that time I was just uh, trying different ideas, making games. I made like maybe 50 games before we made Hotline Miami. Uh, I was throwing them up online and uh, uh, they got a lot of hype. Like uh, a lot of years before Hotline Miami I was doing interviews and stuff about the games. That's how I learned about Jonathan. I. I read it in a Swedish video game magazine. Uh, they did a lot of like coverage of indie devs, and Jonathan was one of them that they did multiple times. There wasn't really any money in it. Uh, uh, I made a game that uh, got nominated for an IGF award, and after that, I got like a patron who uh, gave me a thousand dollars a month for two years, and that was really nice. Otherwise, I would have probably quit making games. Uh, it was just a creative hobby uh, from the start, and uh, there was never a plan to make money off of games. Uh, it just sort of happened. I knew that Jonathan was making games, a bunch of them, and I played a lot of them. So I had like a small idea for a music video game for my band. Uh, so I asked him if he wanted to do it with me, and Jonathan told me that he could do it, but I had to do the graphics because he didn't want to do all, everything on, you know, on his own. That's how we started. That was like the first time I did pixel art. So Jonathan taught me the basics and yeah, that was the first thing we did. Dennis Wiedin had moved from Sweden's east coast to Gothenburg and it was here that he was introduced to Jonathan Soderström. Jonathan, who also went by the handle Cactus, was a well-known figure in Sweden's indie game dev scene. While Dennis was a singer and keyboard player in synth-punk band Fucking Werewolf Asso. Dennis collaborated with Jonathan on an interactive music video for his band. They worked well as a team and decided to try something bigger. Their next project, Life Death Island, was perhaps a little bit too large in scope and never saw the light of day. But the boys enjoyed collaborating and decided to try and work on another game. Dennis ruffled through dozens of prototypes that Jonathan had worked on over the years and came across a top-down shooter that Jonathan had scrapped because of issues with enemy pathfinding. Its name was Super Carnage. I was just looking through a bunch of Jonathan's unfinished games, and I was really into uh, Gauntlet and Loaded, 
uh, Chaos Engine, like all those old top down games. So when Jonathan showed me this game, I was like, this this would be fun to make. I did like the basic graphics over a weekend when my parents was visiting, uh, just like the main character and the, the enemy. And then we just took it from there. It was just supposed to be a small arcade game. And then Blambeer, who worked with Devolver, got the hands on the demo and they showed it to Devolver and they contacted us and asked if we could make it into a bigger game. Wow, that's wild. They actually pitched you on it. Was there any hesitation? Mm. There was a bunch of hesitation uh, because it was a it's a, it's a publisher. So, you're, I mean, it's a, it's a scary thing. At that point, all you knew was like publishers in, in movies and music, they, they tend to like take your IP or the things that you create and then they own it and yeah. But we did mostly talk to Nigel in the beginning and he was very like straightforward that like you own everything. We just wanna you just wanna publish cool games and get them out there. So so that felt like they kinda do the same thing that we're doing but on the publishing side of it. So that was kinda cool. When Hotline Miami was first released in October of 2012, it was all PC gamers were talking about. The game is spread across a collection of self-contained levels where you're tasked with murdering everyone in a building while wearing a selection of masks with different perks. It evoked memories of classic top-down games, but with far more punishing enemies, which forced players to either plan ahead or gleefully throw caution to the wind. Equally as important though was that it was just fucking cool. The colorful, high contrast color palette and in your face soundtrack created a game that was just fun to be in, even as you died over and over and over again. But asking Jonathan and Dennis to explain their design process is tricky because of the nature of their collaboration. Jonathan codes the games, Dennis does the art, but the design responsibilities they share come from an organic, unstructured form of teamwork, almost like band members writing a song in a jam session. Before they knew it, Hotline Miami was here. I mean, one of the main things that we have like a designer philosophy or what you're going to call it is like that we're making a game that we want to play and not think too much about consumers or like how, how will other people read this. So that's make it very easy because if it's not fun for us, then it's or like if it, the idea doesn't feel like a, an interesting idea for our game, that's something that we would like to play, then it doesn't fit. I mean, we, we talk a lot about ideas and stuff, but it's not like we iterate on ideas that much. Either it fits or it doesn't, and usually it fits. Like, uh, I don't think we have had to scrap basically anything we put into the game. Yeah, maybe more like tweaking, but not like this This doesn't work. I think I don't think that happened. It's hard to say who did what in, in, in like broad space, like remembering like whose idea it was. But yeah, like, for example, like dialogue is all on Jonathan. Maybe like discussing like the broad idea what they're going to talk about. But, but I mean, everything was like, it's almost like it's one entity doing all of it in a sense. The game has always been like an, an, an arcade for game first and then a reality simulator second. So it was more like making sure that people could build combos and like have fun with it. So it didn't make sense that the enemies would run away from you because you need to like try and trick them. So you have like kill another one within the window of the combo. So I don't think we never wanted to do like realistic behavior. There was only one way to do it in Game Maker and it didn't always behave the way you want it to, like um, the enemies would just go too close to the wall so it looks like they are almost inside the walls when they're walking next to them and stuff like that. So you had to figure out how to make uh, the grid for the pathfinding uh, perfect. I think throwing the weapons uh, might have been a bug at first. When you were picking up uh, a new weapon, you had to discard the other weapon. And uh, I think I forgot to make the weapon stop, so it just flew away. And it seemed like a cool idea to be able to throw the weapons at enemies. So, so 
so I did mostly like the interior and all the characters. So Jonathan did all the tiles, all the symmetric stuff, because I'm not very good at that. But I mean, everything came very fluently. Everything just came came very natural. It was very simple to make it fit with with Jonathan's style of programming and tiles and all that. The game is actually quite minimalistic in a way. Um... It's just that there's a lot of patterns on the floors and stuff that makes it look busy. So there's not really a lot of objects in a level, at least not in the first game. Hiding the emptiness with the busy tiles is pretty much what worked for the game. I think we also tend to uh, to use like, make sure that we use different colors for tiles and characters so it doesn't merge together. I think that one that's one of the tricks that we use a lot. The main goal for me was to make a game that felt sort of like it was geared more towards adults or at least people my age. Inspire people to try to figure out what's actually going on, so it had to be mysterious. Uh, also, we didn't want to encourage anyone to commit any real acts of violence, so we had to add that element to the story. But also, like we did, it was like important. I felt like with, with the story, and I remember we talked about this quite early that we didn't want it to be in the way for people who just want the game to be like an arcade game. Uh, so you could play the whole game and not have to click through like a bunch of dialogue and watch a bunch of cutscenes. I remember that, that like after I did the graphics that weekend when my parents were using, uh, Jonathan had like a week where he put it all together, like the basics of it. I remember that you added some music that you had on your uh, computer, just like random stuff that you listened to. And I think that was like the first. I don't remember how, did you just put it in there for fun or <laughs> did you have like a plan with that? No, just put it in for fun. So that, that had like a really cool vibe because that music was very repetitive in a sense and almost like hypnotizing. So then I, I started like looking for similar music. I remember Jonathan was like on Bandcamp a lot, just browsing and then showing me stuff like maybe this. And if it was cool, we, we bought the, the soundtrack and put it in, just play with it for a while. We didn't want the music to be stressful. We wanted it to be more hypnotic, not the highest tempo. I sent out emails asking if they would be interested and like explained our position. We didn't know how much money we could uh, afford to pay them. And uh, if they said yes, I sent them on to Devolver and they sorted out the paperwork. <laughs> I think at the, at the, at the end of, uh, of development, we did, when we did like bikers levels, I remember we trying to, to find some songs that fit at that level. It's like for the arcade, for example, like it would be cool to have like a more ship tune vibe to the song. We had some issues releasing the game. That was kind of a pain because Game Maker had some weird assets that we didn't know of. So I think that was very problematic to fix. Like, some people couldn't get the work game to run, and the reason was that they had a printer connected to the computer. And like figure, trying to figure that stuff out was kind of a pain in the ass, I remember. The release was quite stressful, but before that, uh, we weren't too stressed. I, I don't remember us being too stressed, at least. Like the release of the first game was quite fun because at that time, like yeah, the Steam for like the Steam threads were really like cool places to hang out. Like people were very excited for the game and like they were discussing the story. They were doing all the stuff that they that we were hoping they would do, like trying to figure out the story. And then you can like sit down and read and then give them like a bit like a small nudge to think about something. And then they keep on like discussing it. It was it was quite fun. We were super happy with the game. We loved playing the game. We played it a lot. And uh, even at the end of development, when we have been playing it for six months, eight months, whatever it took, it was still fun to play. So it was like, yeah, we did it. We did a game that we wanted to play that no one else has done for us. So I felt like excitement to just finish it. And then just seeing like everyone, or, like a lot of people liking it, it was really cool. We did something just for us. and other people liked it. So maybe we have something good here, just keep on doing what we're doing. So it was not like trying to change anything in how we did the video games or like discussing, maybe should add more people. It was more like, 
this is a good thing we got here. Just please keep on going. The Hotline Miami titles are some of the few games that I reviewed during my time at GameSpot, and while I loved the first game, I adored the sequel. Fans, on the other hand, were divided. There's no denying Hotline Miami 2 is harder, something we'll talk to the team about later, but it was also a lot more restrictive in the way it let you approach levels, a byproduct of a more involved story which limited the number of masks available. Ever since, players have differed over whether or not that restriction was something good or something they found frustrating. So let's start at the beginning. How did they first approach the difficult second album? Well, it started out as a plan to make a DLC for the first game, but pretty soon we decided to, to do everything from scratch because it it felt weird adding stuff to to the game maker project. I could do a much better job at the programming and have it le less messy if we started from the beginning and then it became a sequel instead of a DLC. I also felt like I wanted to redo the graphics a bit. I mean, it's all based on the, like, the same sprites, but change the colors a bit, give it a different tone. So it also felt like it was weird working with the same sprites. It was quite nice that we didn't have to worry about uh, money. So we could spend a lot more time like making a more complicated game. Like there's a lot of more cutscenes and uh, it's a lot more story oriented than the first game. Uh, I think if we wouldn't have added a more complex story, then it would have felt a lot like making the first game again. I guess the story part became more fun to work on since there wasn't that much new gameplay wise that we could figure out that would make sense in the game. And that's why it became a, a big focus. Yeah, I remember very being very excited about all the characters that we came up with, and like all the story elements that was like the main focus. And also like bringing back some ideas that we had for the first game that we didn't talk that much about. We, I mean, we had all his backstory and all of that in the first game, but we didn't tell it. So just trying to do something different, especially with like the, the whole like Tarantino-ish thing of like jumping back and forth in in time and through different characters. I remember that being like really cool, trying to figure out the flow of the levels and like the story. <laughs> it's quite funny story about the whole like mass giving you different play styles <laughs> for the first game because in the beginning it was just meant to be cosmetics. And then, <laughs> then Nigel told someone in an interview, I don't remember which one it was, but he told someone in an interview that the mask, masks also comes with different perks, <laughs> which was not the truth. Uh, so that was kind of like, okay, we have to add a bunch of <laughs> perks to all these masks. And we just tended to like, you know, more guns doing like the, maybe the obvious things. So I remember for the second game, we wanted to do that right, in a sense, because some of them was kind of like not good and like um, Tony the Tiger was way too overpowered. And I remember we had like an idea for him, like, well, just remove his ability to carry weapons. And that could be a cool idea. So that was that was really fun to, to really think about all these like different gameplay ideas for the characters. And I feel like we nailed it because it, as you said, like it makes you, it has it, it forces the player to to do different things and we also wanted to bring in the guns a bit more because uh in the first game we liked i mean melee was the fun part mostly for most levels but for this one we wanted to make more uh, gun oriented levels like bigger levels and so that was that was one of the more interesting things working on i remember At some point in, in when we we're making the first game, we were thinking about doing multiplayer, I think for the briefest period of time. But I think that just carried over to the second game. Like it would be cool to have two characters at the same time. I mean, I think Jonathan had the idea to have like two characters. And then I came up with maybe they should have swan masks because according to legend, I don't know if it's true, but when swans meet, they tend to stick together for life. Like, uh, so that was kind of a cool idea. And I also like when you had like the fans, you have just have the four of them, then you can like tailor the level a, a bit to just them. 
and you don't have to worry about all of the masks should work. So, for example, with the bear mask, you can have some corridors that works for him. That was quite fun. After the launch of the second game then, what did that feel like? Because the first game, you're an unknown, it, it, you know, crazy, there's no expectation, any of that shit. And then with a sequel, obviously you've got, you know, so I can't imagine how many people played it, but they're all going to have their own version of what they think the sequel should be. So what was that like after you came off of 2? Was it similarly enjoyable, the sort of post-launch honeymoon phase, or was it trickier? It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. Uh, I think we were both quite surprised because we were very happy with the game. And we, at least I felt like if people enjoyed the first game, they would love this game. Uh, but that was not the case. So I think it was kind of a, a surprise to us. And also like, it was very harsh, like harsh language. I mean, I'm, I'm not against people not liking the game for different reasons. I mean, we're, it's not a game for everyone, and it's it, it does a lot of things different from the first game, which was like the point. But if you like, I can see that people like the first game but doesn't like the second game because they're more like forced to play in different ways, or maybe it's too much story. But just like how people express themselves to you in comments or emails, I feel that was quite different from from the first game. Because I remember there was like a lot of a lot of critique for the first game as well, for, like for, at Steam, for example. But it was more like if there were bugs, people were like posting them, explaining what the problem was, trying to help you help them make the game work. And and now it's just like this is a horrible, horrible game. I hope you all die, and you suck, and, and a bunch of like swear words and and worse things than that. So that was quite tough, and it actually made me stop hanging out. <laughs> on like forums and I probably hasn't joined since in that sense which is kind of sad because it was kind of cool to hang out with the people who play your games but yeah it's quite different now when we had finished the game we had promised to make a hard mode and that should have been what is the normal mode now and we should have made an easy mode instead yeah, remove some, uh, remove some windows, remove some soldiers. <laughs> yeah, and uh, our publisher told us that the game was really hard for them to play, and we probably should have listened a little bit to that. Uh, the hard mode, I haven't beaten it myself. Uh, I, I didn't even play it. I think Dennis did the play testing on that. Um, so uh, I feel like that should have made me realize that maybe it would be better to add an easy mode and call that normal mode and have the normal mode be hard mode. We didn't want to like restart the, the difficulty in a sense, because we knew that people who played the second game would probably be the people who played the first game. So we kind of want to take it off from where the first game left off so you don't have to play like three or four level stars, like tutorial in a sense. Should we tell him about the technical difficulties we had? Sure, do it. <laughs> yeah. So after we had made about half of the game, uh, Game Maker uh, ran out of memory. So when we played the game, it ran in half speed. Uh, so we were playtesting <laughs> the game at half speed. So that kind of explains why it's very difficult. <laughs> John Woo mode, <laughs> slow mo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When we designed the levels, we wanted it to feel like challenging, which it shouldn't be. It should be quite easy for us to finish the game. But I wouldn't change anything with like the story or the gameplay or any of that. To be honest, I mean, uh, we have seen some some pre like videos recently who has like almost did a almost made a 180 on Hotline Miami 2. That's just kind of fun to see like some people calling it a masterpiece and, and a misunderstood game more and more people are starting to maybe appreciate it a bit more, seeing it for what it is. 
It's clear to see that the reception to Hotline Miami 2 has had an effect on Dennis and Jonathan, and while the series lays dormant, the two have been hard at work on a new game. If there's any lesson to be learned from Hotline Miami, it's that the best way to get better at something is through learning from adversity. Whatever it is the boys have been working on, they've clearly been enjoying it, and are excited to share it with the world. And hopefully for fans of their games, sometime soon. Uh, I'm definitely very excited. Uh, because we've been working on this game for so long now, so I'm really looking forward to letting other people play it. Working with Dennis is a really big part of it. It's just very, it's like extremely fun to work with Jonathan. Like all these cool ideas that we have and it's gonna be compared to Hotline Miami, you can't do anything about it. So that's kind of like, you have to live with that, but it's not a sequel, it's a totally different thing. So I think it's gonna be judged quite differently than maybe Hotline Miami 2 were. And, and I think that's that feels good in a, in a way because it's it's like a fresh a clean start in a sense. Hey, Danny here from No Clip. Thanks so much for watching our documentary. I'm not sure if this is a documentary, more of like a retrospective or a post-mortem on uh, Hotline Miami 1 and 2. I, I think the distance from the game really helped the guys sort of open up and talk a little bit about what it was like when they came out and the, the highs and lows of the various receptions. Um, it's wild to think that it's been 10 years since Hotline Miami came out. Although, I, look, there's a lot of grey hair. Also, this is what happens when I have to cut my own hair for two fucking years. Jesus. Speaking of COVID and remote interviews, while we have been trying our best to spice these up and make them, you know, a bit better than you just watching Zoom calls, you know, by pumping them into CRTs and stuff. Um, we're kind of a, a bit fed up with the remote interviews, you know, producing them that way and all that. Uh, and while COVID sort of continues to, you know, have its peaks and valleys, uh, in 2022, we're, we're gonna hit the road. We really wanna hit the road more, go visit some you know, if we can't go to studios, go to people's houses, go to cities where games were made and catch up with people and, you know, go to remote parts of the American West and, and talk to some studios that don't often get the limelight. We have loads of big plans for 2022 um, and we couldn't do any of it without the support of all the people here and also hopefully, maybe you as well. If you head over to patreon.com slash noclip, you can help us out. Uh, literally every dollar helps. It helps us produce more work. It helps keep the team as the team. It helps us keep all this stuff, you know, influence free, advertising free, you know, paid content free. We've been doing this for five years now and we're really proud that we've never done any of that stuff and we're always going to keep it that way. You know, we, I will close the channel before we do anything like that. Um, so really the heroes are, are all the folks who chip in and help us do it. So thanks so much to all the people here who have been supporting us. Um, and thanks to you for watching this video. And if you're able to, if you have the means, uh, consider chipping in and helping us do more work. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again real soon.